Do you feel a victim? No, I don't. How do you, th what do you, what do you, in this whole story, Monica Lewinsky is what? Uh, um, I think she's a young woman who made some private mistakes and who's very sorry for those mistakes, um, but was also part of um, some other forces that she certainly couldn't control. Welcome to How It Really Happened, I'm Hill Harper. It was an affair that nearly toppled a presidency. A 21-year-old White House intern and the married leader of the free world. Their scandal would make household names of Linda Tripp and Ken Starr, and it would change how the media covers the president. And it would forever change the way we think about blue gap dresses. Tonight, the unbelievable story of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. What happened behind closed doors? and the details of an intricate trap set by his foes that President Clinton walked right into. Believe it or not, the story first broke on the internet on a then relatively little known website called Drudge Report. This is how it really happened. Tonight, the Clinton White House faces a huge crisis over another allegation of sexual impropriety by the president. Oh, my God. This was a thunderclap of monumental proportions. On you go to Washington. Your first job there is? I was an intern. This was a major story. We're talking about an intern in the White House. The reports allege Clinton had a year and a half affair with a White House intern and then allegedly tried to get her to lie about it. It was just so stunning. That issue, did the President of the United States participate in a conspiracy? I just thought, oh, God, no. We wondered, how was he going to react? I never imagined in my wildest dreams it was going to go in this direction. The back of Monica Lewinsky, what was the thong you think? Oh. She's lied either before or she's lying now. Truth and consequences. Who's telling the truth and what are the consequences for President Clinton? The story that becomes Bill Clinton's impeachment begins at the registration desk in a Little Rock hotel long before he becomes president of the United States. The lawsuit is called Paula Corbin Jones Plaintiff versus William Jefferson Clinton. This was an allegation of sexual harassment. Paula Jones claimed that she was working as a uh, Arkansas state employee at a, uh, a conference. Governor uh, Bill Clinton was speaking. She said she gets summoned by the trooper to go up to the hotel room, and at that point, Bill Clinton proceeded to make unsolicited sexual advances. The allegations about President Bill Clinton were salacious, and they were unending. He pulled me and started running his hand up my leg, and um, he tried to kiss on my neck. He wound up sitting down at a couch and exposed himself and asked her to kiss him. And what did you do then? Oh, I stood straight up. I jumped up and I said, I said, I am not that kind of girl. And, and I said, I need to be leaving immediately. On May 6th, 1994, uh, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of Paula Jones against the President of the United States for acts that we believed were violative of her rights. This case is about character and integrity. This case is about the powerful taking advantage of the weak. Paula Jones is seeking $700,000 in damage. Bill Clinton's response was to deny anything of the sort. He, through his agents, he maligned a Paula Jones, said that she was uh, just after money, fame, fortune, uh, and she was just, uh, in essence, trailer park trash. This complaint is tabloid trash with a legal caption on it. One of the civil lawsuits against Michael Jackson had just settled, and one of the tactics that the plaintiffs used in that case was a purported description of Michael Jackson's penis. And Paula Jones' lawyers said, OK, let's use the same tactic. As to avoid that he said, she said, I made inquiry of Paula as to whether or not there were any distinguishing characteristics uh, in Clinton's general area. Which mostly had the effect 
of just being deeply humiliating to the president. It, quite frankly, was uh, kind of a perverse uh, PR strategy. The Paula Jones lawsuit dragged on seemingly forever. It was a combination of uh, legal maneuvers. That went on for several years. There were a number of opportunities to settle the case, but it was something that Hillary was not willing to do. She didn't want that kind of black mark on her husband's presidency. One day after the 96 presidential election, the president essentially sat me down in the Oval Office, and, and he said, you know, there are some people who think I should settle this Paula Jones suit. I said, look, I, I think to be better off settling it, that everything was going well in the presidency. We would won re-election. There was no reason to have this hanging around. And he, of course, in, in the end, didn't do that. It was a big mistake on the part of Bill Clinton not to settle a case. This entire mess with Monica Lewinsky and impeachment would never have happened if he had settled that lawsuit. I remember talking to uh, Joe Camerata about the case. Uh, this is a couple years after it got filed and said, you know, it's unlikely you'll ever be able to prove this unless there are other women out there who will say they had similar experiences. Camerata says, well, what if we got one? And I said, do tell. There was one day that I received a telephone call from a woman who uh, would not give me her name. And she said that she had something uh, happen to her that was similar to what had happened to Paula Jones. Through some detective work, I was ultimately able to figure out that this was most likely a woman named Kathleen Willie. Kathleen Willie was a friend of Bill's. And in 1993, she went to Bill for a job. And instead, she later claimed Bill made his move on her. He hugged me, which is, was not unusual. He's like that. And, you know, and um, um, hug lasted a little too long. And um, he uh, acted pretty badly. I went to see her. And I said, are there others you spoke to about this at the time? And she said, yeah, there was this woman who worked in the White House who I told about it right away. And she said her name is Linda Tripp. Kathleen Willie has named you as a contemporaneous corroborative witness in her sexual harassment claim against the president. She said, well, there's a story here, but it's not the one you're thinking of. She told me about a young woman, a former intern, who was having an ongoing affair with the president. This seemed, at first blush, astounding and improbable, but I wanted to know more. In 1995, Monica Lewinsky came to Washington. A friend of our family's had a grandson who had had an internship at the White House and had thought it might be something I'd enjoy doing. Had you ever worked around in politics and campaigns and been very active? No. I remember Monica Lewinsky, like many interns, were fascinated by their job, who were honored and privileged and lucky and excited and curious about working in the White House. The daughter of a Beverly Hills doctor, she graduated from Lewis and Clark College in Oregon in 1995 with a degree in psychology. From those who worked with her, there emerges a picture of contradictions. Descriptions range from easygoing to unstable. I'd say she was very ambitious. She was, she was a very hard worker. She knew what she wanted, and she, she worked very hard to get it. I had met him in August of 95 at a um, departure ceremony. So were you introduced there or you just... No, he went down the rope line. And... That was the first time? Mm-hmm. And at, at this departure ceremony, he just happened to give me this... Look. Look. Monica later said she got the full Bill Clinton, as she put it which was essentially uh, undressing her with his eyes. She said there was something for terribly animalistic about the way he looked at her. I did the internship that summer and had secured a position 
by late fall of that year, right as the furlough, the, the government shutdown occurred in November. The U.S. government has now been partially shut for 44 hours with 800,000 federal workers idle. In 1995, there was one of these periodic fights between a Republican Congress and a Democratic president, which led to a government shutdown. As a result, the interns took on more responsibility than they normally would have. Monica Lewinsky was working, interning for Leon Panetta, the White House Chief of Staff. She flashed her thong at Bill Clinton and they started flirting. And later that night, they had their first sexual encounter. The way she introduced herself to the president with a flash of her thong underwear indicated and demonstrated that she knew exactly what she wanted and she was gonna get it. If he had said, don't you ever do that, that would have been that and she would have been just another intern. Monica Lewinsky will never be just another intern. Hey, did you say to yourself, this is the president? You know, Larry, I was a, I was a 22-year-old foolish kid, and there was this charismatic, powerful man who was standing there showing interest in me, and I was attracted to him, and I, I think I was swept up you know, with the, with the power of the presidency. After the first physical togetherness, did you fall in love? Not, not, not at first, but I, I came to. First time I ever looked into his eyes close up and was with him alone, I saw somebody totally different than I had expected to see. And that's the person I fell in love with. He was asked, why did you have this affair? And he thought about it a while, and he said, because I could. There were occasions when they would meet in the White House, in the Oval Office. There were also phone calls, some of them in the middle of the night. The timing of these trysts really defies imagination. Were you with the president at times when intimately, and he would also be conducting affairs of state? The story that he was on the phone talking to congressmen? Uh... Yes. Another time he was talking to his political advisor, Dick Morris. What did you think when you heard that? I thought about how incredibly self-involved, narcissistic, and absurd uh, Bill Clinton was for letting this happen while he's president. The amazing thing about Bill Clinton's relationship with Monica Lewinsky was that it was a real relationship. It went on for years. I mean, she put an ad in the Washington Post in February 1997, Valentine's Day, and they had started up in 1995. I mean, this was just, this was pretty long term. There were also an exchange of lots of gifts. The hat pins, sunglasses. In one case, he gave her the same book he gave Hillary, a copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. It's surreal to think that he would be doing that, especially at the time when he was facing the charges from Paula Jones. I mean, he really was courting disaster from day one. I formed an opinion really early in 1996. I knew that the minute there was no longer any contact, she would talk about this. She would have to. She couldn't help it. It was a, it was a part of her psyche. During this period of time that you're seeing him. Yes, I had I had confided in a couple of my friends. And Linda Tripp. Eventually, yes, Linda Tripp. We quickly found out she was quite the topic of conversation in the White House and that she was considered a clutch. Somebody, a female who's too close to the president. Evelyn Lieberman, who was the deputy chief of staff in those days, used to look at Monica like the nuns used to look at me. And I used to think, ooh, why doesn't she like her? Now we know. In April of 96, several people determined that they needed to get her out of the White House. And they wanted to get her over the Pentagon and away from Bill Clinton. And that's what they did. And the rest truly is history. Monica, met her where? Uh, at the Pentagon. This was abuse of a child. Don't ever believe that this was consensual sex. And he went to extraordinary lengths to cover that up. Criminal Abuse of a child, even though she was over. Well, look, she was, I have kids that age. She was 21. Monica is 21 going on 14 on a good day. And, and she... She was a child. She was a mixed up, unstable, volatile child. Linda Tripp was this peculiar woman who worked at the Pentagon, who had an agenda all her own, it seems. Tripp worked in the George H.W. Bush White House, and then Bill Clinton won. And 
And it became pretty clear that she didn't like Bill Clinton very much. The Clinton administration transferred her out to the Pentagon, where she didn't want to be and was unhappy. There were a number of alienated White House employees who had been very successful in writing books about how terrible the Clintons were. And Linda starts thinking about a book deal, and she mentions it to Tony Snow, who had been the White House press secretary. So Tony Snow arranges for Linda Tripp to meet Lucy Ann Goldberg. Linda was, to me, your basic hardworking bureaucrat. Lucy Ann Goldberg is a literary agent who loves conservatives, but more, even more than that, she loves gossip and juice and controversy. And Linda Tripp is manna from heaven for her. It's not about me, it's about Linda Tripp. I was in the position to get information that it looks like the rest of the world was interested in hearing. Monica Lewinsky gets to the Pentagon and she meets Linda Tripp. Monica was looking to Linda, who was older and more experienced in the government, for advice. They liked talking and I think talked very, very frequently, sometimes in person and often on the phone. And when you got to know her, did you like her? Was it? A lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. Like it, an aunt? Like a. No, my aunt's incredible. <laughs> she, was she was nothing what? like an aunt. I have to wait. A bigger mistake between the moment of getting involved with the president and the moment of blurting out that I had the affair with him to Linda Tripp. You as, relate them equally? I, I, I probably have to really? say that. And so Monica chose Linda as her confidant as this relationship developed. She would regularly tell Linda what was going on. You know, I've been in a very unusual situation, and I've been exposed to matters that most people have not been. I'll say. Tripp wanted to sell her story to Lucien Goldberg, which would help Linda Tripp's pocketbook. Have you talked to her about going public with this? Well, then what can you do with it? Well, because of all the dates and the times and the phones and the records. Yeah, but you realize the press will destroy her. My job is to sell books. So I was going to do everything I could to move that story along, sell the book, take my 10% and go on to the next person. That was my motivation. I mean, I, I, it was a job. I'm very interested in this, needless to say. I mean, what? my tabloid heart beats loud. <laughs> if you're ready to go ahead with this, you have to be ready to lose her as a friend. Um, um, that, that, I have already made that decision. I told Linda I had to have more solid evidence than her say-so for her to do a book. She said, well, what can I do? And I said, can you just tape your conversations? And she said, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, you go to Radio Shack and you buy a inexpensive tape recorder. They will tell you how to do it. You just put it on your phone. And that's the thing that got her kind of messed up was that it's illegal in Maryland. I didn't know. It was just you know, the dumbness on, on my part. How would I know? I hate him. No, you don't. I do. These phone calls go on and on, hour after hour, with Monica complaining about her boyfriend, Bill Clinton, whom she calls the big creep. I got to take the creep a tie. Oh, please. I know. It was 20 bucks at Marshall's, and I'm like, it's a sink. Now you can pay homage to me if you want by having a week, a work week in which you wear one of my ties every day. <laughs> Linda Tripp is the definition of the faithless, horrible friend who is dragging these highly personal, highly embarrassing secrets out of Monica, not for Monica's sake, but for Linda's sake. Well, I guess you can count the big creep in a sort of half-assed way. Not at all. I never even came close to sleeping with him. Why, because you were standing up? We didn't have sex, Linda. Not, we didn't have sex. Well, what do you call it? We fooled around. Oh. Sex. I don't know. I think if you go to if you get to orgasm, that's having sex. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's having not having sex is having intercourse. Ugh. You've been around him too long. That's his -uh. rationale. She never said to me she felt guilty, and I don't think she did. I think she felt she had a higher calling. You and I have a good friendship and stuff, and, and I consider you a good friend. On February 28th, the day after Chelsea's 17th birthday, Monica made her visit to the president wearing what would probably become the most famous blue dress in history. 
And the result of the sexual encounter is that there's a semen stain on her, on her dress. How did the semen on the dress even come up? She wanted me to try on some jackets um, that she thought I would fit into, and I did. And um, at that time, she pulled out the semen stained dress and showed it to me. It wasn't one little stain? No, it was everywhere. One day, Linda Tripp calls me up and describes a blue dress that has a stain that would prove what it was Monica Lewinsky had been telling her. And she said, do you think I should take it? I said, and do what with it? And she said, give it to you. What would I do with it? Linda just mentioned it to me almost casually one night. She says she's going to have it dry cleaned. And I said, oh, for God's sake, don't let her do that. Now, Linda, who's not a forensic expert, doesn't know whether it could still be tested. So she asked Lucy and Goldberg, can the dress still be tested? Lucy Ann doesn't know, but she has a former client, Mark Furman, the detective in the O.J. Simpson case, who does know something about DNA evidence. So Lucy Ann Goldberg asked Mark Furman, you know, if there's this dress that's been stained, could you still test it? And he says, yes. So Lucy Ann says to Linda, tell her to save the dress. The navy blue dress. Now, all I would say to you is, I know how you feel today, and I know why you feel the way you do today. But you have a very long life ahead of you, and I don't know what's going to happen to you. I would rather you had that in your possession if you need it years from now. That's all I'm going to say. I, I just, I, I don't trust the people around him, and I just want you to have that for you. What for, though? I don't know, Monica. It's just this nagging, awful feeling I have in the back of my head. But did you ever think of this? If she didn't tell you to save the dress, President Clinton today could be saying he never had a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, didn't Linda Tripp help you? I don't know. I it's. I think that's one thing that I'll I'll probably never be able to reconcile. Because he would have denied it. Right? Of course oh. he would have. On May twenty fourth, nineteen ninety seven, Bill told Monica it was over. Did you receive a call from the president? She would have gone had the whole story not exploded. I'm really sort of trying to do the best I can with a situation that I found myself in. Even though you know you're part of the fault for the situation. Of course, and I, I, I'm not blameless for it. I, I completely recognize that, um, that, I, that I bear some responsibility in what happened. Welcome back to How It Really Happened. I'm Hill Harper. In early 1997, President Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky's affair had been going on for more than a year. But how long could they keep it a secret? At the same time the president was seeing Monica, he was fighting a sexual harassment lawsuit from Paula Jones. Jones's attorneys fought and won the right to question other women President Clinton may have had sexual encounters with. Now they began looking for others to testify. The Paula Jones case and the Lewinsky affair were about to collide and the results for President Clinton would spell disaster. It has been made clear to me that there is no way I'm going to be able to come back to the White House. On May 24th, 1997, Bill told Monica it was over. So then this relationship isn't going anyplace, and Monica realizes that she's going to have to figure out where is she going to land, and she expresses an interest in going to New York. You received a job offer from Revlon with the help of Vernon Jordan, is that correct? Yes. She enlists the help of Vernon Jordan, one of Bill Clinton's closest friends and allies. He's thinking to himself, I'm going to take this girl, and I'm, I'm moving her, and the reason I'm moving her is because she was my girlfriend. I'm afraid to hear him say, yes, of course I'll do that, and then him not do it. Clearly, the president was trying to keep her happy. She would have gone had the whole story not exploded. The Paula Jones lawsuit was working its way through the system, and uh, it came time for depositions to be taken. The judge had said other women who were state or federal employees were fair game to be subpoenaed as potential witnesses. 
in the Paula Jones lawsuit if it fit into a pattern of Bill Clinton's conduct. The lawyers for Paula Jones became aware of Linda Tripp and Monica Lewinsky, and so they put them on the witness list. So you went to the Paula Jones lawyer? No, mm -mm. but I allowed them to find me. By letting it be known that you could well, be found? Well, um, I told Lucy Ann Goldberg that if they contacted me, I would be forthcoming with them. It eventually was clear that the Paula Jones lawyers were having outside legal help from a network of conservative lawyers who I call the elves. And one of them is Ann Coulter, the famous conservative activist. Another one is a lawyer named Conway, who is married to Kellyanne Conway, who becomes a very famous person during the Trump campaign. And this group, who are working in secret for Paula Jones, become the glue between the Paula Jones case and the Monica Lewinsky matter. They figure out that if they could get the information that Linda Tripp has about Monica Lewinsky into the hands of the Paula Jones lawyers, they could really create a lot of mischief. That's exactly what they did. Bob Bennett, Clinton's lawyer, in preparation for his deposition, goes through a list of names who might come up. Monica Lewinsky is named. And Clinton poo-poos the whole thing, says, you think I'm crazy to get involved with someone like that? Good, good question. Bear in mind that this was a carefully coordinated political trap set for Bill Clinton to fall into. In the morning of December the 17th, uh, did you receive a call from the president? Yes. What was the purpose of that call? To tell me uh, that my name was on a witness list for the Paula Jones case. Once I had been subpoenaed in the Paula Jones case in December, um, and that Linda had been subpoenaed in the Paula Jones case, my antenna started to go up, and I was petrified. I was concerned because um, the subpoena had called for a hat pin, that I turned over a hat pin, and that was an alarm to me. It mentions a hat pin, one of the gifts that Bill Clinton has given her. So she begins to suspect someone has been telling the Paula Jones lawyers about their relationship. And she goes to Linda Tripp to speculate about that, not knowing that Linda Tripp is the person. There, there is no one that would do this to me, and no one that knows anyone that would even, you know what I mean? Oh my God. She's continuing to talk to Linda Tripp, who she thinks is her good friend. Someone has told them something. Now, do we think that that's a little something or a lot something? Winsky, after consultations in Washington with the Clinton loyalists, signed an affidavit saying there was no sexual relationship. And at the same time, she's becoming more and more anxious about getting this job. So it could look more and more like Bill Clinton is trying to get her a job in order to keep her quiet. In the beginning of 1998, uh, Bill and Hillary went to the Virgin Islands on a vacation. A long angled camera was able to capture the two of them dancing on the beach. There was a speculation that this had been arranged for, for public consumption to show that they were indeed still very much in love. Bill and Hillary not having a care in the world while all this turmoil is about to unfold. This just in, Kenneth W. Starr, a Republican and former appellate judge and solicitor general, has been named by a special court to take over as independent counsel in charge of the Whitewater investigation. Ken Starr started with the investigation into Whitewater. Whitewater was a real estate transaction in which it was believed that Mrs. Clinton and perhaps the president had gotten a special deal because they'd had insider knowledge. Starr was an odd choice to be the independent counsel special prosecutor. He'd never prosecuted anyone. He had never worked in criminal law. I think his motive was always to be a devoted public servant. I'm certain 
that when he first came in 1994, his thought was, this will be done in about six months. What happened was, as the investigation went on, a bunch of other scandals involving President Clinton or Mrs. Clinton occurred. For example, the White House Travel Office investigation. We also got assigned to handle the Vince Foster uh, investigation. Mr. Clinton canceled his public appearances today except to share his grief over Foster's apparent suicide. Vince Foster was the deputy White House counsel and he tragically killed himself. There were allegations that he was murdered that was never proven. The Whitewater case by late 97 was beginning to look like it was meandering and going nowhere. Star is getting heat. When are you going to wrap this thing up? And then suddenly, along comes Monica Lewinsky. We first heard the name Monica Lewinsky when we got a call from Linda Tripp. We were completely uninterested in whether he was having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. I think presidents should be allowed, even encouraged, to have all the affairs they want. That wasn't what was going on. What we were told by Linda Tripp, who's a very intelligent and manipulative person, is that Monica Lewinsky is being asked to lie for the president by Vernon Jordan and she's being asked to fill out a false affidavit. So they took it upon themselves to start investigating whether there had been obstruction of justice in the Paula Jones case. Paula Jones gets connected to Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky leads back to the president. It's a disaster. Linda Tripp was scheduled to meet the very next day with Monica Lewinsky. What better way than to wire her up and see if she can corroborate some of the things she's been talking about with us. Linda is wearing a wire. Of course, Lewinsky has no idea. It, I, mean, I feel like we're in the middle of the John Grisham book, frankly. Tell me the honest truth, Monica, because this means a lot to me. Has he already said that? What? Yes. Someone else knows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He has said, it doesn't matter what anybody says. He just denies. The only way that I'm going to get in trouble is if truthfully, is if he's in trouble. Right. Things are reaching this remarkable moment of crescendo. I get a phone call that day tipping me off that the FBI was involved, that Ken Starr was involved. I nearly fell off my chair. I mean, my God, this is real. This is going to explode. Ken Starr's investigators decided that it was time to talk directly with Monica herself. To see if she would cooperate with us to see whether or not there really is obstruction of justice going on. Tripp invited Monica Lewinsky to meet her at a food court in a mall. Monica Lewinsky thought it was a social occasion. It was not. Linda told me they were going to meet at the courtyard coffee shop, and evidently the place was swarming with FBI. Little does Monica know, not only is Linda Tripp not her friend, not only has she been recording her, but who's waiting for her, not just Linda Tripp, but FBI agents. Linda Tripp was, was keeping notes in a notebook she writes about Monica, we are on opposite sides. Guilt is still there, but lessening. Her decision to lie is hers alone. Linda called me from the escalator and said she was on her way to meet Monica. She, she said, I see her now. Then the phone goes dead. And uh, I never spoke to her again. All of a sudden, the FBI agents descended on the place. They took Monica up to a hotel room. That's when I knew uh, I was... I was in trouble. This was definitely something that had gone awry. The strategy was to flip Monica, get her to talk about Vernon Jordan's efforts to get her a job in exchange for her being quiet about her affair with Bill Clinton. That's what they were hoping. 
but it doesn't quite play out that way. She decided not to tell us anything. At one point, Monica's allowed to leave the room, and she passes Linda Tripp on the escalator. And at this point, she knows Linda Tripp has betrayed her. Thanks a lot, she says. They did it to me, too, Linda replies, which, of course, is a total lie. Nothing of this has broken yet. These storm clouds are gathering just over the horizon, but most of the media and the public had no idea. When was the last time you spoke to Bill Clinton? January of 98. Before, Obviously before this broke. And that was a goodbye call or a... No. I mean, of course not. Nobody knew this was going to happen. Tomorrow in the nation's capital, President Clinton will be deposed by Paula Jones' lawyers. He becomes the first sitting president to testify as a defendant. January 17th is the day of the deposition of Bill Clinton in the Paula Jones lawsuit. And he has no idea what he's walking into. Do you understand, sir, that your answers to my questions today are testimony that is being given under oath? Yes. If the president had known how much we knew about Monica Lewinsky, I believe he would have either delayed the deposition, settled the case, or answered in a very different way. And uh, your testimony is subject to the penalty of perjury. Do you understand that, sir? I do. He uh, sticks to his script, claims he doesn't remember Paula Jones, and then the questions come about Monica Lewinsky. Did anyone other than your attorneys ever tell you that Monica Lewinsky had been served with a subpoena in this case? I don't think so. Clinton went into his deposition with some confidence about the Monica Lewinsky situation because he already knew that Monica has signed an affidavit saying nothing had taken place. So if he denied it and she denied it, he thought he was probably home free. And then he got a strange gift. Instead of just asking him in a straightforward way, did Monica Lewinsky perform oral sex on you? They asked it in this incredibly convoluted way. That allowed him to sort of talk around the truth of their relationship when a straightforward question would have yielded a complete and obvious lie. This is a definition of a term that will be used in the course of my questioning. And the term is sexual relations. He was asked whether or not, under the definition in the case, he had sexual contact with Monica Lewinsky. He brazens right through it and denies a sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky and figures the whole thing is over. Council is fully aware that Ms. Lewinsky has filed and has an affidavit which they are in possession of saying that there is absolutely no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form with President Clinton. It's absolutely clear what sexual contact meant under the definition, and he lied about it. Eight of her affidavit, she says this, I have never had a sexual relationship with the president. Is that a true and accurate statement as far as you know it? That is absolutely true. After he did that, he uh, was then on record under oath in the deposition as having lied. And uh, that really set the basis for everything that followed. At that point, I thought this was a no-brainer of a story that this was going to be one of the biggest and most explosive political stories in Washington in years. But the editors at Newsweek were nervous. We were racing towards a deadline. It was uh, late in the afternoon. We had to make a decision whether to publish or not. We knew it was possible that this could lead to the President of the United States being removed from office. Are we sure we know what we're talking about here? Are we sure this reporting is true? And so late on Saturday night, we made the decision not to publish. They were just afraid of it. They were afraid to come out and publish a story saying that the president of the United States was having a blatant affair. Obviously, I was bummed. We knew more.
about this than anybody else. Nobody else had talked to Linda Tripp or Lucianne Goldberger or knew about how Ken Starr had gotten involved. And the phone rings and it's Mike and he's furious. He's absolutely livid and he said, they're not gonna run it, they've spiked it. So that's when I took it to Drudge. I said, I'm sitting on a story that nobody wants to publish. It's yours if you want it. Drudge Report, January 17th, 1998, 11.32 p.m. The Drudge Report has learned that reporter Michael Isakoff developed the story of his career only to have it spiked by top Newsweek suits. Hours before its publication, a young woman, 23, sexually involved with the love of her life, the President of the United States. Since she was a 21-year-old intern at the White House. She was a frequent visitor to a small study just off the Oval Office. Where she claims to have indulged the President's sexual preference. Michael Isakoff was not available for comment late Saturday. A potentially damaging cloud is hanging over the White House this morning. This story is a bomb, literally, that drops out of the air. CNN has confirmed that Whitewater Counsel Kenneth Starr has been granted permission to expand his investigation. What we wanted to know was everything. Information about an alleged affair continues to pour out of Washington. We had absolutely no idea what was going to come at us. We had no idea that there was going to be a semen-stained blue dress. Today, more details and more denials in the matter of Monica Lewinsky. There were salacious accusations that the public had never heard before. Meet Monica Lewinsky. Do you, Monica S. Lewinsky, do swear or affirm? Did he do it? Didn't he do it? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. What we realized is this has just begun. I did. When you first saw your name mentioned, do you remember your first reaction? I mean, it was just, um, it was scary. Initial reports of this shocking affair spun Washington on its head, and news outlets scrambled for details. Some answers came from reporter Michael Isakoff. Days after news of the affair leaked, Newsweek released Isakoff's article, publishing it online, the first time they had ever broken a big news story on the web. But this was just the beginning. Monica Lewinsky, Linda Tripp, and a cast of dozens were now stepping onto the national stage, a stage befitting the Shakespearean drama about to unfold. Next time on part two of How It Really Happened. Thanks for watching. Good night.